Amen. We are in this season posturing, readying, preparing ourselves for just that, for a mighty move of God. We believe God wants to do something in our lives. How many believe God wants to still do something in your life? Are you guys expecting God to like to move, to speak, to I think we can get into these seasons of our life where where we're just not expecting anymore. We're just not like, we're not ready, we're not prepared, we're just, maybe we get into, I don't know, a comfortable routine, we get to, maybe it's a level of a su- success or attainment, or, or maybe it's, it's a, just, a, we fall into mediocrity, uh, or for whatever it is that, that maybe pulls us away from this anticipation of God's move and fire and breath and voice in our life. In this series, we're kind of calling us back into alignment. We're saying, God wants to move. Amen? God wants to move. And what we need to do is just, is just get ready. We need to align. And we need to prepare. We need to posture our life in such a way that, that God sees. And, and in this series, we're, we're studying the postures of our life and heart that actually attracts the presence of God. Because God is speaking. That God is moving. And he does desire to move, it's just oftentimes we're not ready. We're not ready to hear. We're not ready to. We're not ready to to receive. We're not. We're just not postured. We're not aligned correctly. Second Chronicles chapter seven, verse fourteen says it like this: If my people, my God, defined people, this is God speaking, declaring a, a promise here, respond by humbling themselves, praying, seeking my presence, and turning their backs on their wicked ways. God says, I'll be ready for you. Like if you, if you ever get to this place where you need a move, where you need, to, you need a, a, a breakthrough, where you need, here's, here, I'm going to give you a recipe. Here's what you can do, and I promise you, I'll be ready for you. I'll be, I'll be ready to move. I'll be ready to speak. I'll be ready to heal. I'll listen from heaven, forgive their sins, and restore their land to health, the Bible says. So there's three things I want you to see in this scripture. And the first is, This isn't a promise for everybody. This is a promise God says for my people. If my people, who are they? Who are my people? Jesus actually said in the Gospels, he said um, that those who are of my father do the will of my father. That he says, hey, if if you're my people, if that's, that's who it's to. First, I want you to point that out. It's my people. That's who this is for. Second is for those, he says, are God defined. One translation says, who are called by my name. Uh, Are you, are you embarrassed to identify yourself as a follower of Jesus Christ? Are you embarrassed to identify yourself as a Christian in the climate of today? Listen, everybody else is loud about their beliefs and loud about what they believe. It's time for the Christians to get loud with love to get loud with grace, to get loud with patience, not loud with judgment or condemnation or bringing fear, but loud by saying, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. If my people who are called by my name, my God-defined people, and then the third thing I want you to know, this is why we're studying this, there is a premise to the promise. To every promise of God, there are, a, there are premises to the promise, the four conditions for healing and restoration is what we're studying in this series. Because God says, I'll bring healing and restoration. Not only to your land, but we're talking about full, like God wants to heal your body, your mind, your emotions, your relationship, your finances. And there are four conditions that God says, here's the premise, and I'll give you the promise. Last week, we studied one of those premises, one of those postures that God responds to and he's attracted to. And that's the posture of prayer. That God says, like, if you just pray, if you'll, if you'll pray to me, man, I, I will answer you. So we talked about praying without ceasing and how some of you thought that was like a little something you did before your meal, something you did on your knees at, at, at bed. It was a moment you had with God. But what we're learning is this, this is an ongoing posture that God desires to have with us. It's not a moment, it's moment by moment. That not to continually babble, no, not continually talk with God, but to continuously bring him into every life situation. That is what he means by pray continually, is I continuously invite God into my life. I invite God into my decision. I invite God into my morning. I invite God into every area of my life. I put God first. I pray continually, and that posture is so attractive to God. 
And some of us have been afraid to pray. We're afraid that we don't know how to pray, so we're kind of tearing down those walls of saying, no, it's not what you think it is. And during this season, we're having 21 days of, of prayer right here at Discovery in this room from 6.30 to 7.30 just to kind of bring some realignment and posture ourselves. And we're, we're, we're learning five directions to pray in five. If you missed last week, you got to check it out, okay, because we're really practicing this during our morning prayer and encouraging you to practice it as well that if you want to posture your life for prayer there's a, there's this five there are five directions of prayer and the first is when you start with you, you start praying you need to look backward to the cross that every all your prayers are contextualized by the cross by the redemption and the forgiveness and the grace of jesus christ so the first direction is looking back to the cross then i look up to the father I look into the Holy Spirit, ask God to examine my heart. I look around to ask God to use me. And, now, and then the fifth direction is I can look forward to my future in faith. These are five directions of prayer, the posture of prayer. Today is the, the second condition, the second premise that God says, I promise you, I'm ready. I'm ready if you would just pray. The second condition, he says, was if you will humble yourself. If you will humble yourself. Um, the Bible says that, that humility is, is not just a posture, it's a practice. That you have to humble yourself. You have to go, it says that you need to clothe yourself with humility. You have to put this on. Let me say it this way. It is a constant choice of your will to choose humility. It doesn't always come easy. Does it? It doesn't always come easy to put others first, to, to choose the, the low road. Uh, the low road. Uh, it doesn't come easy. It's a practice before often it is a posture. Sometimes you want to fight back. Sometimes you want to yell back. Sometimes you want to demand your way or force your way. But he says, no, no, you got to humble yourself. Humble yourself. Clothe yourself with humility. Humility is not, I've said this before, it bears repeating, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. That's what humility is. That's what God is attracted to, the Bible says, that he's, he responds, is drawn to a heart that is humble, that is clothed, that postures themselves, where, where you're, not, you're not thinking of yourself less, you're just thinking less about yourself. It's, you're, it's not self Focus. It is, it's, it's a God-focused life. And then after it's a God focus, it's it's an others focus. And then I'm down here, self is last. You see, the that most of us, if we just kind of respond to our human inclination, it's self first. What do I think? What do I want? What are my feelings? And then somewhere down here is others, and then God might be down here if we're honest. But God says, I will respond to a humble heart. Let me ask you this question in your notes. Do you want more? Do I want more for me or more of God? Do I want more for me or more of God? Here's, here's the truth, you guys. God wants more for you than you want for yourself. I promise you. Like God wants so much more for you than you want for yourself. Uh, it's just, it's just a different access point. What our definition of more isn't the right definition of more oftentimes because the more that God has to offer comes with us starting at dying to ourself. It comes with taking up your cross. And it goes against our, our logic. It goes against the grain of the human condition and the human heart. Today, I wanna, I, I wanna talk about one of the most like prevalent uh, uh, one of the most popular forms of pride, and that is entitlement. See, when we think of pride, uh, I think that a lot of us think of like the arrogant pride, the I'm better than you pride, the pride that says, um, you know, I am, you know, all of that, and I'm better than everybody else. And that's where our mind goes to when we think of pride. But for most of us here, that's not the pride that we deal with. It just isn't. It's just, we know ourselves, we know our weaknesses, we know our past. I'll say for most of us, that's not the type or the form of pride that we're susceptible to. It wasn't the form of pride that the Israelites were susceptible to. 
When, when in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, when God is making this promise and this premise to the Israelites to humble yourself, they didn't get out of alignment because they thought they were so good. They got out of alignment because they thought they deserved so good. And they didn't have any responsibility at all. And so most of us, when we fall subject to pride, when we get out of alignment with God, it's often because we fell prey to this attitude of entitlement. An attitude of entitlement will, will prompt you to grumble about the, about the blessings you don't have instead of thanking God for the blessings you do have. It'll cause you to focus on, this, on the wrong things in your life. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. Here's, here's like the secret to humility is right here in Romans 12, 3. The first few words, do not think of yourself. <laughs> That's it. Man, we would solve a lot of problems in life, in our marriage, in our, in our, in our ministries, in our churches, in your relationships, if we, just, if we could just go against the human condition a little bit and put on and clothe ourselves with, with the garment of Christ, with this spirit of humility, do not think of yourself. That's what humility is. He says, don't think of yourself more highly then you ought, we live in an age, in a time of entitlement. It's extremely prevalent in our culture. Wouldn't you say that? Everyone believes that everyone else owes them a debt. Everyone believes that everyone else owes them something. Ours is a generation of entitlement. So I'd like to address what entitlement is in that spirit that can even infiltrate our hearts, our lives, the life of the believer, a church, a body of Christ, that entitlement can creep in and defile the bride of Christ even. What are they? Here, write these down right here. This is what the spirit of, the, of entitlement says. It starts here. I am exempt from the responsibility. That's what entitlement says. I am exempt from the responsibility. I don't want to work. <laughs> I like money, <laughs> but I don't want to work. I like to eat, but I don't want to work. Um, I, I, I don't want to pay my bills, but I don't want to be in debt. I don't, want to, I don't want to pay my bills, but I want nice stuff. I don't want to pay my bills, but I want to get the best education. Ooh. I, I, need a, how about this? I need a mental health day. That's what, that's, what your week, that's what your day off was, okay? That's what the day off. No, I'm just, okay. Don't get a, some of you are looking at me like, I really need one. I know some of you really do. That's why we're here together in the body. Well, I want to, you're going to, you're going to, today, this is a mental health day for you right now. God is going to fill you up and encourage you, I promise. But that spirit of entitlement will rob you. It'll say, man, I need, I need, instead of what I have, I have, I am, I am. It just fills you with just, I am exempt from the responsibility, listen, there is a premise to the promise that you have a role to play in your health. You have a role to play in what God wants to do in you and through you. And I know God is awesome and all powerful and all knowing he has a great plan for your life. Yes, but God's power does not exempt you from your responsibility. It does not. We are ultimately responsible for the actions we choose to make. We talked about this last week, that God oftentimes is our Hail Mary. We, spend, we, we, we get years and years and years of financial bad stewardship and debt, and we want one moment in the altar to take care of it. God, help me. Absolutely. God will help you. Yeah, trust me, God will help you. But that spirit of entitlement is going to get you back in that same place. I am exempt of the responsibility. I was reading Dr. J. Vernon McGee. He was a, you know, a pastor and theologian. He used to tell a story about a young man who came up to him and said, I so believe in the sovereignty of God that if I stood in the middle of a busy highway and my time had not yet come, I believe God would miraculously deliver me. And Dr. McGee replied, son, if you stand in the middle of a busy highway, your time will have come. This isn't old, right? This isn't old. This is the beginning of time. Adam and Eve had this whole spirit of entitlement. It was one of the first things that attached itself to the human soul was, hey, God, I know I mess up, but it, no, no, I don't know I mess up. It was the woman you gave me. That's what it was. That's what Adam said, right? It's that I am exempt 
from responsibility, but forgiveness and restoration can't happen until you accept full responsibility for your actions. There is a premise to the promise, and our spirit of entitlement is keeping us from the best things of God. I'm exempt from the responsibility. Here's the second thing that entitlement says, the spirit of entitlement. I am owed special treatment. I mean, don't I just, I am a child of God. I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. Absolutely. Just trust me, man. You are, you are, um, you are the, the apple of God's eye. Don't you know how special I am? My mama told me how special I am. She told me how good I sing and how good I looked. Entitlement isn't, is, it's not easy. Uh, well, let me say this. It's easy to see in the life of others. It's not easy to see in your own life, is it? It's hard to spot in ourselves some diagnostic questions to help you spot it. Do I often feel discontent? Do you feel envy or resentment over the blessings others seem to have? Are you disappointed with your life? Do you doubt God's provision for your life? Do you often unfavorably compare yourself and your situation with that of others? That comes from a spirit of entitlement. Entitlement is rampant in our society. It's creeping into the church and that consumer culture church in the hearts of everyday Christ followers like we are owed something. Actually, it's the other way around. God says, no, the world doesn't owe you anything. You're to bear your cross for this world. It's, it's the other way around, child of God. I was in this restaurant not too long ago. It was with my family, my wife, my kids. We were in a restaurant and there was, uh, we were in the tucked away portion of the restaurant that probably wasn't the best seated area. And there was a big family having a, like a, just some gathering. They had their kids, a lot of kids. And some of the kids were on their games and, and the games were making loud noises. But there was this other family that was over tucked away in this, in this area with us. And, and the, the family with the kids was just, their devices were making too much noise for the family next to us. And so the, they, you know, politely or not so politely, maybe asked him to um, turn down the volume of his game because they're trying to have a conversation. And this ensued a war between two families of, of just arguing over, over the silliest thing. And I'm telling you, it got, it got out of control. They started calling each other names. The manager had to come in and had to, had to like remove one of the families and give them a different spot and comp a meal. But at, <laughs> As they were leaving, the family that you know, told the other family about the, the noise of their, their game and their kids said, said I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you. And the other one said, no, I'm going to pray for you. God bless you. God bless you. And it was, it'll tell you, it was, my kid was filming it. Caleb was like, oh, my God, oh, my. We have it today. It was, it was funny, but also my heart was, can I tell you, so disgusted at the same time and so grieved that these people were so entitled about about what they felt they deserved they were even using god to posture and position themselves like they were owed some type of special treatment hey here's let me get really practical if you want to you know posture yourself for humility don't demand the best seat or the best table or the best parking lot parking spot hey those are, if you're a leader hey don't demand the, that proverbial seat at the table. Don't, don't, don't demand, don't, you are not owed any special treatment, I promise you. That is a spirit of entitlement. God will lift you up. Amen. Not man, not you, definitely not you. God will exalt you. That chronic spirit of complaint is one of the sure indicators of an attitude of entitlement. Gratitude, on the other hand, is the habit of the humble. Practice humility. Clothe yourself. When you want to complain or you want to criticize or you want to demand what you deserve, clothe yourself. Instead of before you open your mouth, because all of us feel it, all right? All of us have been in the restaurant with the kids making too much noise. Before you open your mouth, clothe yourself with humility and start thanking God. Start thanking God. Here's, here's, here's a third spirit of entitlement. This is that I'm excused of from all the consequences. I'm excused from the consequences. I don't care what the consequences are. I should be able to do whatever I want. The consequences don't apply to me. And we have our excuses. We have our reasons why. Because they deserved it. 
because they were really bad. They messed me. They, they, we have our excuses of why the consequences don't apply to us. Romans chapter 12, verse 3 says, it's important that you not misinterpret yourselves as people who are bringing this goodness to God. See, this is, this is at, the, at the foundation of humility. It, it's not only this, this practice that we have, that we have to clothe ourselves and make a conscious choice to, to practice humility, but, but at the core of it, we, we, you have to know who you are in Christ, that yes, you are loved, yes, you are a son, yes, you are a daughter, but you are also undeserving of it. We know ourselves. We know our sin. We know our past. Don't think of yourself as people who are bringing some goodness to God. No, God brings all that goodness to you. See, the only, he says, the only accurate way to understand ourselves is not by how much you bring to the table and how good you do and what difference you're making or, or how much. No, no, no. The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what he does for us, not by what we are and what we do for him. Humility is not a lack of confidence or a low opinion of yourself. That's not what humility is. There was this guy named Paul. He was an apostle of the gospel, but before that he was part of a group of high-ranking Jewish priests known as the Sanhedrin. And in fact, he was one of the youngest who had ever been considered for placement in that special group of people. He was taught by some of the greatest teachers of history, both scholars of the world and of his religious circles. He's probably the most qualified person to share the gospel of Jesus Christ that anyone has ever been. But this is what he writes to the church in Galatia. Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. May I never boast in all of my accomplishments, in all of my degrees, in all the churches that I've planted, in all the people that I've raised up, in all the letters that I write that the churches still read. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So this is what biblical humility is. Biblical humility is simply the opposite of selfishness and empty conceit. See, I want us to consider that humility is not so much, the antithesis of that is not so much pride. See, humility is, is not thinking of self. The antithesis that I want you to be able to understand of, of what is uh, the opposite of humility is humility is, is God first, others first, and the opposite of humility is self first. It's a self first, self focused life. It is an entitled spirit, an entitled attitude that puts self at the center instead of God and instead of others. Luke 14, 11, Jesus says, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. And those are the choices. God says, look, you can either humble yourself or be humble. Jesus says, sit down, be humble or get humble. But it's not quite as harsh as that may sound. In fact, the posture of humility attracts God in such a way that it comes with these promises, doesn't it? It comes with these benefits. God desires so badly for us to humble ourselves so that we can access the blessings and the promises and the provisions of God. It is only in the the soil of our hearts, when, it's, when that soil is humble, can only that seed of God's spirit bear fruit. It's only in the soil of humility. So let me give you some of the benefits and even some application today, why we need to clothe ourselves, practice, and choose humility. Here's number one. Number one, here's one of the benefits, because God will guide me. When I choose humility, when I clothe myself with humility, the Bible says, God, if I'm humble, God will guide me. I don't know if you ever go, I don't know what, I don't know what to do in this situation. I don't know what step that I should take. I don't know what job I should take. I don't know if this promotion is the right thing for me. I don't know if this relationship is what God wants for me. I don't know if I should hold on or let go. When you don't know which way to turn and you're confused, listen, get humble. Get humble in God will guide you. If you're humble, God will guide you. Psalm 25, verse 9 says, God leads the what? 
God leads the humble in the right way and teaches them his will. If you want God to lead you, all you have to do is get humble. You want God to know what God's will is? God's will is not, even, not given to prideful people. God's will is not given to arrogant people, self-focused people, self-sufficient people. The humbler you are, the more God will guide you. And the, and the, more, the fewer mistakes you're going to make in life. The more humble you are, the more God will guide you, and the fewer mistakes and missteps that you're going to make in your life. That's the benefit. So what's an action for that? It's not in your notes. You may want to write it down. Here's the action. Seek God's plan, not your own. Seek God's plan, not your own. At times, you may be confident that you're doing God's will. But on, on other occasions, you may be unsure about the direction that your life should take. At times, you're going to wander aimlessly. We all do. In a wilderness of our own making. And at some times, you may struggle against God in a vain effort to succeed by your own merit, by your own strength, attaining happiness by your own power. But wherever you find yourself, whether on the mountaintop or on the valleys or at the crossroads of life, you can be assured, listen, that God is there. That, that God is there. And you can be assured, listen, that he has a plan for your life. And you will discover that plan the moment you get humble. If you can manage to align yourself with God's plan for your life, to posture yourself, you will receive restoration and healing. Seek God's plan, not your own. Here's a second reason why you need to clothe yourself with humility, and that is God will bless you. God blesses me when I'm clothed with humility. These promises are all throughout Scripture. I just gave you one verse right here, Isaiah chapter 66, verse 2. God says, I will bless those who have a humble and contrite heart. See, God, God does not bless ego trippers. God does not bless prideful people. God does not bless people who secretly think that they are better than others. God doesn't bless that. He doesn't. No, God says, I'll bless those who have a humble and contrite heart. So what do we need to do? You may want to write this down. Find ways to put others first. Find ways to put others first. You got to practice this. You have to clothe yourself with this. God will bring you some opportunities. Someone said they get in the longest line at the checkout stand just to, to remind themselves to slow down, to be patient, to be humble. I don't know about that one. <laughs> it's hard for me because I, I go. I'm fast. I'm, I'm like diagnosing the math. I'm like, that's about 40 items. That's, that's 20. <laughs> slow down. Put others first. Why are you putting your, why are you, why do we measure it? And I, right? Why do we, wait, how about, here's a really good practical one. Put the shopping cart back. Don't put it in that parking spot. Have you ever done that when you pull it in the parking spot? You're like, there's a good one. Dang it. What happened? You know what happened, didn't you? Because you left it there. You do it the cart in the middle of the, it's just some practical ways. Don't try to find the best parking spot. Pick up trash wherever you find it some practical ways. How about, how about some, some more difficult ones to put others first? How about you forgive others quickly? Because really when we're talking about unforgiveness, we're talking about that same spirit of entitlement. Why? Because they hurt me. They wronged me. I didn't like that. And any time that it's self-focused, at any time it becomes about self, that is the opposite of humility. How about seeking ways to serve others? Get on a dream team. Hand out some notes. Serve at kids ministry. Check some people in and some families in. And park a car out in the... Is that, is it, what does that do to your spirit? If your spirit goes, I'm just... No, no. And we've had some people come through Discovery and they said, no, no, no. I'm somebody. I'm somebody. You want me serving somewhere else because I'm, I'm somebody. And I'm just telling you right now, this, our practice with those people is you go serve in a parking lot. You hand out, you can, you know, go change out the toilet paper or something in the restroom. Because I'm serious. We have people come in posturing themselves the wrong way. And, and you, don't, you, don't get to, you don't get to levels of leadership at Discovery if you're not a servant. If you didn't serve first, you ain't leading anything. Okay? How about, how about you just serve? 
somebody. Find a way to serve. How about, here's a more difficult one. As, how about being respectful and honoring your authorities? Even the bad ones. I mean, just find some way to put others first. Clothe yourself with humility. Here's a third benefit to clothing yourself with humility. God will relieve my stress. God will, when I am humble, my stress goes down. When I'm prideful, my stress goes up. That's one of the indicators if you know you're clothed in humility. If you're high stress, high strung, when you came in today, even feeling it, you probably have a self-focus, not a God focus or an other focus. It's probably a self-focus. But God says, if I clothe myself with humility, look what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. Take the yoke I give you, Jesus says, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble. And I will, look at this, restore deep rest to your soul. God says, if you just clothe your soul, wouldn't you like that? Deep rest for your soul? Well, how do you get that? How do you get deep rest for your soul? Wouldn't you, you know, like that if you're all dried up today? You got nothing to give. You got nothing left in you. You feel like you're tapped out. God says, if you just humble yourself, I'll, I'll restore your health. I'll give you deep rest for your soul. So here's, here's the application for it. Write it down somewhere. Stop trying to do it alone. Stop trying to do it alone. You know, it takes, it takes a, someone who, who knows themselves well to say, to say, I need help. You know, this is one of the reasons why we do small groups here at Discovery. One of the big reasons we do small groups here at Discovery is because every one of us needs each other. We need each other help. And, and one of the reasons why we don't get into a small group, some of us think, well, you know, I don't need it because um, I don't need friends. I don't need people. I don't need, I don't need help. I don't need encouragement. I don't need to open up. I don't need to open up with anybody. I'm okay. I am okay. Can I tell you, that's, that's a self-focused spirit. That's the wrong spirit. God's not attracted to that spirit. And if you want to posture your life and realign your life to get yourself blessable, where God's, God's spirit and God's presence is attracted to your life, you, you got you to gotta get humble and stop relying on yourself. Stop trying to do it alone. Get some other people around you and open up. Let them know what's stressing you out, what's hurting you, what's painful, what's eating you up. Let, let them know. Let some people in. That'll, that'll clothe yourself with humility. Here's the fourth benefit. God, when I clothe myself with humility, God will give me the power to change. God will give me the power to change. If I'm humble, God will do that. He'll give me the power to change. You know what the power to change is? It's one word. Grace. Grace is the power to change. You need grace to make the change in your life. See, there's some stuff in your life that you'd like to change, but you can't. And you've tried, but you can't. And you won't. Well, you won't. The only way you'll ever get change is by the grace of God. How do you get the grace of God in your life? The power you need to change. Well, it says in James chapter 4, verse 6, that God opposes those who think they can fix it themselves, those who think they don't need help, those who think they got it under control, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He gives grace to it. The more humble you are, the more grace God gives you. The more prideful you are, the more on the opposite side of God you are. Literally, you are opposing God, and that's not an opponent you want to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with. I promise you, your arms aren't long enough to box God. And then what a, great, what a scary thought. Whenever I am self-focused and I have this, I'm sufficient, my self-focus, that I'm actually standing in opposition to the Spirit of God. I am an opponent of God. And God says, if you will just stop focusing on yourself and stop trying to get ahead and stop trying to control and stop trying to manipulate, if you would just lower yourself, you know what, do this. Just stop thinking about you. If that's all you do, I'll give you grace you need to change. I'll give you the grace you need to grow. I'll give you the grace you need to love. 
the way you're supposed to. Now, I'll give you the grace you need for patience. I'll give you the grace you need to take care of that addiction once and for all. I'll give you the grace you need if you will just lower and humble yourself. So here's the last application I'll give you. Empty yourself to be full of God. Empty yourself of what? Self. Just empty you. Just empty. Empty yourself of yourself so that God can fill you. I reach from grace to grace not to be the same at the end of this life that I was at the beginning. And the power to change is the most beautiful biblical definition of grace that there is. Grace, grace for us not to abuse, not to abuse it at all. But grace is the power to change in the face of a broken world, my broken mind, my broken will, my broken heart. Empty yourself and God will fill you up. So I ask you again, do you want more for you or more of God? Come on, let's bow our heads all across this worship center. Pray together as we align ourselves right now.